Welcome to the Oklahoma Historical Society. We are so delighted to see all of you today. I see some very familiar faces and we are extremely excited to kick off our 2022 lecture series with an extremely important guest. Um, Trait Thompson, basically in 2020, was voted unanimously by the Board of Directors to take over the Oklahoma Historical Society as Executive Director. Um, I am extremely proud to say that Trait has been a very staunch leader of the Historical Society. He is an o OSU Cowboy fan. Don't mistake that. I did. So we're, I'm working on that. So, But um, Trait, before he began his employment with the Oklahoma Historical Society. Trait worked as a business consultant. He served as adjunct professor and for three Oklahoma universities. He served as a political advisor and as project manager for the multi-million dollar state capital restoration project. Now what that entails, I do not know, but we have a wonderful speaker who is going to present for us today. And I always tell, um, I always told Trait and Chad, I said, by looking at the crowd, you can certainly tell Chad Williams isn't doing the program. So, but Trey, we appreciate so much all of your leadership and the efforts that you have made on behalf of the Historical Society, but also the state of Oklahoma. So without further ado, I, I bring to you our wonderful speaker, Trey Thompson and my boss. So thank you, Trey. It is such a pleasure to be with you today and talk about something that I'm certainly very passionate about and I spent a good deal of my life, about six and a half years of my life working on, which is the restore, restoration of our beautiful state capitol building. And uh, it, when I was working in the pro tem's office and I worked there from 2010 to 2014, you know, we, uh, the pro tem, Brian Bingman at the time, had worked for about three years to get legislation passed to be able to start the restoration project. And it was a difficult time in the legislature and, and uh, particularly the House of Representatives wasn't so fond of, of doing bond issues at the time. Finally got that legislation through and uh, I went and talked to the director of OMES at the time and said, hey, you know, I think that you're gonna need, you know, I, I would really like to toss my hat in the ring for being someone to help to manage this project. I have some project management experience, but also understand the politics of the building pretty well. Little did I know what I was getting myself into because, uh, boy, I, I, you know, I'm glad I did the project, but there were, there were a few rough years there, certainly, to get this project off the ground and to make sure that it was done right. And so I'm, I am thrilled that as we're sitting here in 2022, the restoration project is almost finished. And I have to tell you, it's more incredible than I could have even imagined back in 2014 when we started the project. The way that uh, all of the craftsmen and all of the people working on the building, all of the state employees in the building and the elected officials have rallied around the project and really made sure that we did something good and worthwhile. Uh, it, we did not, take the half-hearted approach. We did not cut corners on that, and I believe it's showing pretty well over there. And so I want to talk to you today a little bit about the history of the state capitol building itself, and then I want to get into the restoration project. And I've got lots of photos to show you about everything that we've done throughout the process. Not everything, because this you'd be here tonight if we talked about everything. But I'll give you a good understanding of the general part of the process. So let's start where we should start. And that is in the beginning. And uh, we can't really start this story without talking about how the Capitol came from Guthrie to Oklahoma City and all of the politics and all the personalities who went into that. But I like to start the, this uh, presentation with a quote. And the quote that I like to start out with is, it's a fun quote. This was given uh, in 1915 at the cornerstone dedication of the uh, state capitol building. And one of the members of the capitol C commission, his name was Arthur Lee Craft, they were asking, well, how long do you think the capitol is going to be around? And he said, I think it's a safe guess that the building will be there when this and several other generations have gone, unless it is attacked by zeppelins. And I do not think there is much danger of that. 
So, you know, today we're dealing, you know, there, there's a lot of similarities in history. We're dealing with a pandemic right after the Capitol was finished. They were dealing with a pandemic. We still deal with deferred maintenance and we still deal with some of these issues. Thankfully, we do not have to deal with the Zeppelin attacks. So I'm very, very glad about that. Let's talk about the timeline on the state Capitol. So November the 16th, 1907 is Statehood Day. That's when President Theodore Roosevelt signs the proclamation. Oklahoma has officially become a state. Uh, a, about a month or so before, we had voted on our Constitution. We had voted our elected officials in office, and we were just waiting on the federal government to officially recognize us. Well, in the Enabling Act that was passed in 1906, there was a provision in there that said that Guthrie had to be the state capital until 1913. And so we, uh, we move into Guthrie. Of course, Guthrie is very excited about being the state capital. It had been the territorial capital as well. We start having state government in, in Guthrie. Our governor at the time is a man named Charles Haskell. And Guthrie, uh, believe it or not, um, it still is today actually, Guthrie was a Republican town and Oklahoma was all Democrats. Democrats swept into office and for more or less the next hundred years, Democrats would hold most of the statewide power in Oklahoma and elect most of the members of the legislature. And so Guthrie being a Republican town, there was a man named Frank Greer who published the local newspaper there. He was not a fan of Charles Haskell and not a fan of Democrat government and essentially, uh, uh, Charles Haskell got tired of all the criticism that he endured, and so he wanted to get out of Guthrie as fast as, as he could. And that was one of the major, uh, I guess one of the major impetus points for leaving Guthrie was the fact that let's go somewhere where there's a little bit of more of a friendly territory, so to speak. Well, uh, to be able to do that, uh, they got an initiative petition together, they got enough signatures, and they got a ballot initiative on the, on the, the ballot. Now, most of the time these today, these come at either a primary election or a general election. There's going to be a special election, and on June 11th, 1910 is when they set the election. Now, we're going to talk about the whole state steals, state seals stolen story and some of this. I'm not going to dive too deep into all that. Uh, I will say that the state seal wasn't really stolen, but I will also say that there, uh, uh, that doesn't negate that there were shenanigans. There were shenanigans because basically it's Oklahoma and it's politics and there's always shenanigans. So um, that election was supposed to take place on a Tuesday. Charles Haskell scratches out that date and says, we're gonna have this on June 11th, 1910. That's a Saturday, Saturday election. What are we doing there? Well, guess what's not open on Sunday? the courts. So if you want to file a motion, if you want to protest the election, you can't get into the courts on Sunday. And he thought that would buy him that little bit of extra time he needed in case the folks in Guthrie wanted to pitch a fit. And of course the folks in Guthrie uh, wanted to pitch a fit. So the whole seal, the, the story of the state seal is sort of a big legend now. We don't know exactly what happened. Everybody has their own little story around it. But essentially it's this, Charles Haskell's in Tulsa. He commissions a special train car to take him back to Oklahoma City. He calls his, his private secretary and says, go to Guthrie, get the seal, bring it to Oklahoma City. There's a story of the midnight ride, sneaking the seal out into a bag of laundry, all of those kinds of things. But the long and the short of it is, it's hard to steal something that you already own. Uh, what the people of Guthrie were not really expecting is that the capital would move immediately. They figured the election happened, but the Capitol wouldn't move until 1913, just like the Enabling Act said. Haskell kind of pulled a fast one on him in that he went to the Lee Huckins Hotel in Oklahoma City, really scrawls out a sign in handwriting, slaps it up on the wall and says, guess what, the Lee Huckins Hotel is the new state capital of Oklahoma. And that, of course, got everybody into a frenzy. Well, of course, Guthrie brings a lawsuit. And the, uh, the, the Oklahoma Supreme Court ruled on November the 25th, the 19th, or November the 15th, 1910, they said, you didn't write the ballot question correctly. This is struck down on a technicality. Now, Oklahoma is really in limbo. Where is the capital? There were some state officials that were staying in Guthrie because they wanted to make sure that their official, that their actions were official and would count. Other state officials who were loyal to the governor were coming to Oklahoma City. It was kind of a big mess at the time. 
On December the 29th, 1910, the legislature, uh, they come into special session. They meet in Oklahoma City at a couple of downtown buildings in Oklahoma City, and they pass a bill that locates the capital in Oklahoma City. Now, there had been a plan by a man named I.M. Chartel to establish the capital. He had donated land at, at present-day Putnam City area, donated that land, and that was where the, the capital was going to be. Legislators didn't like that plan. First of all, it's a pretty long streetcar ride all the way out there, and it's close to the stockyards, and they don't like the smell. So they go to John uh, Culbertson, and they go to William Harn, and they say, you know what we like? We like that little plot of land you got in northeast Oklahoma City, just about two and a half miles from downtown. We would love it if we could put a state capital there. So both of them pull the parts of their land together, and we get the current location right across the street of where we are now as the new location of the Oklahoma State Capitol building. They pass that into legislation. Of course, are the folks in Guthrie done yet? Of, of course they're not done yet. Uh, they decide that they're going to take this to the U.S. Supreme Court. U.S. Supreme Court rules in 1911, and they say, listen, this is an issue of federalism. Every state has to be treated equal. Every state's a sovereign state. The federal government can't tell a state where it's going to have its capital, so that provision in the Enabling Act is struck down. Oklahoma, you can have your capital wherever you want to have your capital. And so, are the folks in Guthrie done yet? Oh no, they're a feisty bunch, those, and so they decide that they're going to, to uh, get another initiative petition together, and they're going to, uh, to get the same city, so it was Shawnee, Oklahoma City, and Guthrie that were the choices, and they have another vote on November the 5th of 1912. Finally, uh, after all the wrangling, the vote comes in, Oklahoma City is the state capital, and we can finally go about the business of building our capital. Now, by this point, by the time we get to July 20th of 1914, we had been a state for seven years without a permanent state capital. And so now, we finally get to start that process. Who are the key players in this? Well, the key players are the Capitol Building Commission. The Capitol Building Commission was established in statute to be the ones that would oversee the building of the state capitol. Layton and Smith were the architects, and of course, many of you have heard about Solomon Layton. Solomon Layton was a prominent Oklahoma architect. He had designed courthouses, he designed public buildings, schools all across the state. So the original Oklahoma City High School building that was, uh, that's over here now, that's the OCU Law School building, that's one of his. Skirvin Hotel is a Solomon Layton building. The Bizzle Library on the OU campus is a, is a Solomon Layton building. So many prominent buildings across the state. He really was a prolific architect, and he and his firm are hired to be the ones to design the Oklahoma State Capitol building. The contractor that was hired was the James, Stu James Stewart and Company Construction. Now, James Stewart and Company had previously built the Idaho State Capitol and the Utah State Capitol, so they were very well versed in capitol building. Governor Robert Williams played a key part. So at the groundbreaking ceremony, it was Governor Lee Cruz, who was, who was the second governor of the state of Oklahoma, who participated in that. But only a few months later, Governor Williams comes in, because at that point, remember, Oklahoma governors could only serve one, uh, one term, and it was a four-year term. So Governor Robert Williams, who had previously been on the Supreme Court, came in to uh, really take the project the building of the Capitol all the way to the end. Governor Williams is a really interesting guy. I've got a good story about him here in a second, but um, Governor Williams, he was, uh, what's the right word? Miserly, tight, stringent with the money. He was very, very involved. We would call him a micromanager today. He walked the site. He was very involved in analyzing the finances. He wanted to make sure that Oklahoma was not going to get taken for a ride by any of these contractors or any of these vendors or anybody that was involved in the capital project. Now, one of the interesting things that they did is they got Edward P. Boyd on loan from the federal government to come and be the superintendent and watch over the project for the state. Boyd's an interesting guy because he, had, he worked for the Department of the Treasury. He was an architectural supervisor for them. He was on loan, uh, like I said, from the federal government. Uh, Governor Cruz had to go and appeal 
to President Wilson and say, hey, can we borrow this guy? He was on a post office building project in Muskogee. He had built the post office in Oklahoma City. They said, can we borrow him? He was paid $300 a month for his services. One of the quotes by uh, Boyd, he said, the Oklahoma Capitol is the best constructed and cheapest public building anything like its size in the country. And while there had been much graft in other similar projects in, in other states, I can't fault uh, the governor Williams or Boyd for what they did because uh, to my knowledge, and I've done lots of research on this topic, you can find no issue of any, any graft or any bribes or anybody that got sweet deals for building the state capitol. It really was a very efficient project. The groundbreaking happens on July the 20th, 1914, and this is a photo from that. The, uh, the gentleman in the white hat there is Governor Cruz swinging his silver-plated pickaxe, which we do still have in our collections here at the Historical Society. 5,000 people attended that ceremony, and it was a big deal. You have to think about it. Seven years, and you didn't have a permanent state capital. This was bringing legitimacy to the state. This was a symbol that our state of Oklahoma is growing up, and uh, it was actually recorded by the Universal Film Company. I would love to have that film today. It's been lost. If you're digging around in your grandma's attic, can you come across an old or spool of film somewhere? Maybe you have the long lost Capitol footage. We would love to see it sometime. Lee Cruz turned the first dirt and then W.B. Anthony. W.B. Anthony also being of the fame of the guy who drove and got the seal from Guthrie. He was on the Capitol Building Commission now, and he also participated in the groundbreaking ceremony. And I love this quote. Uh, Cruz said, this is not a time for speech making, but a time for work. Talking may be all right in arranging and planning for a state capital, but talking never built a state capital and never will. And they subsequently went on to make a really long speech. So <laughs> <laughs> talk a little bit about the construction on the state capital. We, there's some unique features about our state capital that come out, and you can really see it in the very first picture there. First of all, James Stewart and Company wasn't brought on until 1915. So the first few months on the state capital project was done by day labor. That was all the materials purchasing, all of the work was overseen by the Capitol Building Commission and Edward Boyd. So that in and of itself is phenomenal. And that photo that you see down at the bottom there, the, the long panoramic, those are the day laborers on the project and that uh, took that photo in April of 1915 with the structure of the Capitol going up behind them. So the structure of our Capitol building was concrete. It was not a steel structure. Now this is a pretty unique thing for back in that time period. Of course the Romans had invented concrete, but its use as a structural material was very, very new at the time that this building was built from 1914 to 1917. And so for a while, it was our state capital was believed to be the largest concrete frame infrastructure building in the world. Don't have anything to back that up, but, it, but there are several newspaper reports that report that from back in that time period. So it was unique in that aspect that we had a concrete frame infrastructure building. The other thing that we had is you have to remember we're building this 1914, 15, 16. Roads at that time were not great, and also we didn't really haul goods and materials by road a lot back in those days. We didn't have interstate trucking. So what do they do? The Santa Fe Rail Spur, that runs still to this day right out here. It's what you drive under the underpass on 23rd Street if you're going uh, east and west on 23rd. They just ran a spur off that railroad and they brought all of the materials up to the building by rail car. And so they, they had the whole building surrounded by rail car and you can see it right here in this photo. You can see one of the rail cars right there in that photo. The stone for the building uh, was not integral to the structure of the building. The stone is actually, it's, it's ornamental, it's hung on the building. Uh, they used iron cramp hangers to hang, hang the stone on the building. Um, here's an interesting fact about our capital that I always love to point out, and this gets into you know, the building process here. The legislature only authorized three stories for the building. Now, that kind of went in contrast or in conflict with one of the goals that they had, which is they wanted to get all of state government into the Capitol building. 
For seven years, they had been renting space either in Guthrie or in downtown Oklahoma City, and they wanted to get rid of those rental fees and costs. And so they needed a building, building big enough to get all of state government into it, but the legislature said it can only be three stories. So um, we get a little creative because we're Oklahomans, and they say, okay, we need a six-story building. We can only do three stories. Okay, here's the deal. This, the, uh, we're going to call, um, we're going to have a sub-basement, which is, uh, then we're going to have a basement, then we're going to have a first floor, so the first floor is today's second floor, then we're going to have a mezzanine, which is today's third floor, then we're going to have a second floor, which is today's fourth floor, we're going to have a third floor, which is today's fifth floor, and we're going to have an attic, which is today's sixth floor. So, uh, officially, our capital is a three-story building, although it is uh, totally six stories today, so... Uh, always fun. Politics doesn't ever change, no matter what era we're in. I always love to talk about the dome, because there's so much misconception about the dome. Uh, I've heard that they didn't build the dome because of material shortages. I've heard that they didn't build the dome because they ran out of money. Neither of those are really accurate. If in construction, and some of you may be in construction, if you've ever heard the term value engineering, that's what happened to the dome. Basically, they decided with the money that they had and what they wanted to spend their money on, they decided a dome can wait, we can put it on later, or we can not put it on at all. But the dome was essentially value engineered out of the project. And there were some, if you see the quote up here, I'm going to read it to you just in case you can't see it. There were some who didn't want a dome at all. Uh, one of the B Capitol Building Commissioners, Stephen Douglas, said, in modern architecture, the dome has no place. It would cost $250,000 to put one on this building, and it would, however, be all expense without any use whatsoever. So our Oklahoma uh, forefathers, they were really practical. Why put this big ornamental, nice-looking hat on a building when we can save that money and do other things with it? So... The dome wasn't eliminated due to the project running out of money. It wasn't eliminated because of material shortage. It was essentially the fact that we have other things we want to spend our money on, and right now it's not a dome. Now, one thing that they did decide is, and this is very, very, um, uh, this is a lot of forethought on their part, and we're glad that they did that. They put the structure in place when they were building the dome to be able to hold the weight of the dome. And so that helped us when 85 years later, Governor Frank Keating gets together an effort and says, we need to finish our Capitol building. We need to put a dome on the building. Now, one of the other myths that I heard uh, time and time again on the Capitol project is, well, did the, the dome damage the building? We shouldn't have put the dome on because it caused damage to the building. That's actually not true at all. Our building is as structurally sound as it, as it ever was. That concrete infrastructure is not going anywhere anytime soon. I assure you. So the dome that was put on the building in, in 2002 was a much more lightweight dome than would have been put on in, back in 1917. That dome would have been made of solid limestone. It would have had a concrete infrastructure just like we see on the rest of the building. It would have been very heavy. Our dome today is a steel structure with, uh, with uh, uh, cast, uh, cast concrete cladding and it is much lighter than the dome uh, our dome weighs about 5 million pounds today. The dome that would have been put on back then would have been much, much heavier, and the structure that's in place would have been able to, to hold it. So Governor Williams said, I am not against putting a dome on the Capitol, but I do not think the time is right just now for spending that much money when the state is in need of so many other necessary and useful institutions. One of the things that he wanted to spend money on instead was the, uh, the state hospital, which is now the OU hospital just down the street from this building today. Oops. So the completed capital. The building was completed ahead of schedule. It was scheduled to be completed on June the 30th, 1917. Uh, I'm sorry, it was scheduled to be completed in August of 1917. It was completed in June. Now get this, the building was completed for $1.5 million. $1.5 million. I always like to joke, we could lose that much money in the couch cushions at the Capitol today. Uh, $1.5 million didn't even get close to the design fees on the Capitol Restoration Project. So it was, uh, uh, they built an incredible building for $1.5 million. We estimate today 
If we were to build the Capitol building all over again today, same materials, same ornamental plasters, same marble floors, the whole nine yards, build it the exact same way, even if you're going to keep the dome off, you would probably be in about the billion dollar range to build a building like that today. Uh, because simply this, the trades and the crafts to build that, the stonemasons, uh, we had to search far and wide for some of the laborers and some of the workers who could do some of this very, very skilled plaster and stonework, even on the restoration project. The building is essentially uh, the exterior. So the first floor base exterior going all the way around the building is Tishomingo granite. They quarried that from an area near Tishomingo called uh, Ten Acre Rock. That quarry has since played out. So we, when we went for replacement granite, we had to go find something similar in other places. And Hoosier Gray, Indiana limestone was the limestone that was put on the building. Initially, if you look back into newspaper articles and, and pieces of legislation, they wanted to use all Oklahoma materials on the Capitol. But essentially, it became too expensive to quarry those materials. And to find enough matching stone to be able to use just became problematic. So they went to Indiana. And of course, that's why Indiana limestone is so prevalent. It's such a great building material. And it's, it certainly stood the test of time on our building. So the interior floors are Alabama marble. What's interesting is uh, the, the uh, Edward Boyd talks about they, they got the Alabama marble floors. They were going to put terrazzo in, but the, Alab the marble company said they wanted the prestige of having their floors in the Capitol, so they gave it to us as the same price as putting a terrazzo floor in the Capitol. So pretty interesting fact there. All the wall bases and stairways are Vermont marble. The walls are all hollow tile blocks that were covered with plaster. Originally, all of the walls in the Capitol were supposed to be limestone blocks, but those were value engineered out of the project as well. But keep that in mind. I'm going to bring that up again here in just a minute of how we've incorporated that design into the building. There was uh, four elevators in the building. There, were, there was an, an internal vacuum cleaner system in the building, which is just so interesting to me. So I think Solomon Layton was kind of fascinated by that technology, because if you go to the Marlin Grand Home in Ponca City, which he also designed, it's got an internal vacuum cleaner system. So I think that was cutting edge for 1915, 16, and he's like, we got to have one of these things. Now, we did still leave some of the ports around the building, and if you know where to look, you can find them. They had, they had been painted over. They were brass, but they had been painted over, and we went and restored them back to brass. So they're kind of, you look about two feet off the ground on the walls somewhere, sometimes you can see those internal vacuum cleaner ports there. The, stay, the, the skylights, there were skylights throughout the building and, uh, that, were, that had stained glass with them. Eventually, over time, the skylights were covered over because, like all skylights, they leaked pretty badly. Uh, but we, uh, we have restored all of the stained glass in the building. In fact, the man who did that is sitting right back there. Wave to everybody, Tim. He restored all the stained glass in the building. And it looks phenomenal. The uh, grand staircase, one of my favorite things in the whole building. Stand at the base of that grand staircase and look as that giant marble structure goes up two stories up to the fourth floor of the building. Just awe-inspiring, and it really talks about, to me it speaks to the power of architecture and what architecture can do. When you walked into that building, they wanted to, to show you through the architecture that you weren't just coming into any old building and you weren't just coming into any old government building. You were coming into somewhere important, and, it, and nowhere makes the statement like that, like that grand staircase from the second floor to the fourth floor. Now, one of the other interesting features is the second floor railing around the oculus is alabaster and not marble. And that was quarried in Northwest, uh, Northwest Oklahoma. And to our, to our knowledge, it's one of the largest alabaster structures in the world right there on the second floor rotunda. A lot of interesting facts. I do want to tell one story before uh, about Governor Williams because it does speak to, um, it does speak to the kind of manager he was on this project. So in 1916, he's walking the project. He sees a discolored stone on the front side of the Capitol. He calls over uh, the superintendent for the James Stewart Company and just rails on him. Says, you know, why are you got this discolored stone out here? This looks terrible. This can't be on my Capitol. He said, take this down immediately. Well, the superintendent for the construction company says, well, I don't think we can do that. 
you know, it's going to possibly cause destabilization for the other areas of the building. I'll tell you what, I'll give you a $5,000 credit. Now just to, to put this in context, a $5,000 credit for one discolored stone, today, in today's dollars, that's about $128,000. So that's a big concession, but Williams wasn't having it. He wanted that thing to be perfect, so they agree to go into arbitration. So uh, Williams gets uh, Edward Boyd to be his representative, the superintendent and the construction company, they go and get E.K. Gaylord. The two meet together, they talk it over, and they come back to the governor and say, take the $5,000 credit. The governor was ticked, but he did it anyway. But that just goes to the, to the kind of management he did on this project. Nothing escaped his, his view as they were going through that. Now the legislature moved into the Capitol before it was finished. On July, or I'm sorry, on January the 2nd, 1917, the legislature moves in. Now, those of you, I see a few of my friends here who work in state government, who have worked uh, in the building while we've had construction going on. Now, those folks have had to endure a lot, a lot of weird noises, a lot of weird smells. Well, our, our predecessors back in the day had to endure the same thing, because when they had the first session in the Capitol building in 1917, here's a quote by D.B. Collins, who was a representative from Adair County. He said, when the pounding of the hammers got too loud, the legislature had to adjourn for the day or else go into some other part of the building. So uh, what's past is present again, and, and all of our legislators and all of our people in the Capitol had to deal with all of that again as well. I do want to to fast forward now to 100 years later. Of course, our capital, it grows and changes over time. Probably one of the biggest changes to the landscape around the capital was in 1936, when the Oklahoma City oil field comes to state government. Governor E.W. Marlin says, you know what, we're gonna drill on state land. He calls the National Guard out because there was a city ordinance uh, preventing it. He says, we're gonna get some of that money. So next thing you know, oil wells, poof, all around the building and uh, those start going up, that money starts going into the state coffers, then you start to have the buildings that go up around. Governor's Mansion goes up in 1928, Historical Society Building, which is now the Courts Building, goes up in 1930. The Jim Thorpe Building goes up in 1939, about the same time as the Armory goes up, and so the complex starts growing, government buildings north of the Capitol start going up in, uh, in 1960s and 1970s. So, but we had never in all that time had a real comprehensive restoration of the state capitol. And so we certainly needed to do that, and it was getting into dire straits. And so talking about the need for restoration, it's a good quote from capital architect Dwayne Mass, who worked with us on this project. This project is about the preservation of something that we can't replace. And that is absolutely true. We have one capitol building, uh, no one else will ever build like this again. It's too expensive. It's too expensive and it's too time consuming. When you lose it, it's gone. And it is as much a historical artifact and a historic resource as it is anything right now. So I'll talk a little bit about how we got to where we got to. As I mentioned before, there was efforts uh, starting in the early 2010s to fund the capital restoration project. In 2012, there was a bond issue that, went, that passed the Senate and it went over to the House and it died a horrible and painful death. It got 15 votes on the floor of the House, and it, that, it takes 51 to pass anything. So no capital restoration then. In the meantime, the OMES had put up yellow barricades in front of the Capitol because there was so much stone spalling off the building that we were afraid it was going to be a, a, a safety hazard to somebody. You had to walk into the building under this ugly scaffolding so a piece of stone wouldn't fall on your head. So it's Circumstances are growing more and more dire. In 2013, they passed a bill to appropriate money for the capital restoration project, but it was coupled into a tax cut bill and it was struck down by the Supreme Court. You can't have two subjects in the same bill. And so in 2014, finally the third time's a charm, House Joint Resolution 1033 passes, and it establishes $120 million in a bond issue. Now, we all knew that that $120 million was not going to be enough to fully finish the capital. If you looked at other capital restoration projects across the country, you looked at uh, um, Kansas, 
was a $330 million project. Wyoming was about a $267 million project. Minnesota was a $310 million project. It just, it didn't take much research at all to figure out that 120 wasn't gonna do it. But the thing about it is, is we didn't know what the real number was. And so with that first initial funding, we were able to start that process of really doing that investigative work. The other things the bill did is it established an oversight committee for the project that was made up of appointees from the governor and the speaker and the pro tem. Uh, it designated the project to be a design build project and it named OMES, the Office of Management and Enterprise Services as the agency that would oversee the project. In the meantime, we go to Kansas and one of the things, Kansas had just finished their project, but their project had taken 14 years. So can you imagine, we're finishing up the eighth year of the project, can you imagine uh, <laughs> having that many more years to go to get to 14 years, uh, just, uh, I can't even imagine it. But Kansas had taken 14 years, they'd done over 10 bond issues. The Speaker of the House in Kansas told us, do everything that you can to get your money up front. He said, out of our $330 million project, we anticipate that we could have saved at least $50 million had we gotten all the money up front and been able to phase the project appropriately. You don't have construction companies mobilizing and demobilizing, changing scope based on changing circumstances. So we took that message back to the legislature and thankfully they listened. They passed House Bill 2168 in 2016 that gave us the rest of the money that we needed in order to do the project. The, the final tally for the project will come in somewhere right around $275 million. We've been able to earn interest and premium on the bond issue, and that's given us uh, the ability to uh, go a little bit over the 245. Here are the teams that worked on the project. So start out with the team from the state of Oklahoma, Office of Management and Enterprise Services. And of course, that was me coordinating a lot of uh, that work. Uh, like I said, I was the only full-time state employee solely dedicated to the capital restoration project, but we had our team in the construction and properties division that was working uh, with us as well. We have architects over there and, and folks helping manage the budget as well. We had the state capital repair expenditure oversight committee, which we called SCRIOC for short, because we always have to have an acronym in state government. And we had mass architects, Dwayne Mass is the capital architect, but his company was brought on to be what we call our owner's rep to help make sure that all the, the work being done by the companies is being done appropriately. And finally, we had WJE Associates that we brought on out of Chicago. They were our exterior stone restoration effort uh, experts that helped us to manage that work as well. Let's talk a little bit about the exterior restoration first. What we're addressing on the exterior restoration of the Capitol is we had spalling of the stone like I've talked about. We had staining of the stone. Uh, corrosion of the original steel windows. We had water infiltration. Basically, you know, we wanted to shore up the building and make it watertight so that uh, we could stop all the issues that were being caused. Now, I want to show you some photos here. This is what we were dealing with. We were dealing with stone uh, that had no joints, no mortar in the joints anymore. Uh, because of improper uh, repointing projects that had done before, they put in a mortar that was too hard for the stone. It had long since chipped out of there and that was causing water infiltration. We had really bad erosion and staining, uh, particularly on the front of the building. This picture in the middle here is the south side of the building. And showing you once again, this picture on the right is the mortar. Uh, that we encountered on the project. And at one point in time, uh, they knew they were having problems and instead of going through and doing a true mortar repointing project, they decide, let's just smear this concrete slurry over the top of it and I'm sure that'll be fine. Um, a lot of times the, the battle we were fighting was not just neglected maintenance, but it was wrong maintenance. And those were the, the two battles that we had to fight over things that had been done in the past. In some cases it was they did the best they knew how. In some cases we knew they'd taken the short road and it, and it had caused us big issues. The windows were corroded and rusting, the original steel windows, the spandrels, the, the cast iron spandrels, the same case. And then the, the picture on the bottom right, you can see the tunnel. The tunnel that went from the Capitol to the parking lot east across Lincoln. Uh, some days you needed a canoe to get through that tunnel. More damage, the original, uh, the original steel doors were warped and rusted. The stair railings were, um, you know, looked like a high school shop project and were really failing. The light well walls were also in bad condition, broken sidewalks, so we had quite a bit of work to do here. 
we went through, we hired two general contractors on the project, and I get asked sometimes why we did that. We really felt like we wanted to get the right expertise for the right phase of the project. We had three companies that, that, um, that applied for, or that put in bids for the interior and exterior project. The company that ended up getting the exterior work was J.E. Dunn Construction. J.E. Dunn Construction had done numerous historical exterior renovations across the country. They had done the uh, Union, I'm sorry, the Union Depot in Kansas City. They had done the World War I monument in Kansas City. They had done the, uh, the Minnesota State Capitol, the Kansas State Capitol, the Wyoming State Capitol. So they had a lot of experience in exterior stone restoration. The architect that they brought on was ADG, which is a local architecture company here. And then their historic uh, preservation consultant was Trainer HL out of Topeka, Kansas, who had helped them on many of those state capital projects that they had done. The engineering firm was ZFI. The stone restoration team was Mark One Restoration. I will tell you this, those guys were incredibly talented. And what was so fun is you would walk the scaffolding and you would see them doing their work. Uh, on, on a lot of construction sites, if you're hearing a foreign language, it's usually Spanish. Uh, when you were up on our scaffolding, you were he hearing Polish. Most of those guys were all from Chicago, and they all spoke Polish out there. And it was, it was a trip. It was great. Review was our window restoration company, and they're out of Kansas City. St. Louis Antique Lighting out of St. Louis was our lighting restoration. Uh, Gary Beam, who you see in the picture right here, I call that guy a mad scientist. Gary Beam is a guy who in the 1970s just started tinkering around, fixing old light fixtures in his basement. Next thing you know, his neighbors are bringing him their old light fixtures, and next thing you know, he's got a company that's done the lighting in over 30 state capitals across the country. He not only repaired and refurbished all of our original light fixtures on the interior and exterior, but he also fabricated new period appropriate light fixtures for us to replace uh, some worn out fixtures in the building as well. Terracon did all of our lead paint abatement on the windows on the exterior of the building. We went through an intensive investigation and trial repair phase. We wanted to make sure that we knew what we were getting into. We didn't want to just go blindly and, and hope we could come up with solutions. So we spent a good eight months going through. You can see the team. We cut open pieces of stone. We looked behind the stone to see the conditions. We had the WJE team that rappelled down the building, and they had iPads, and they noted the condition of the stone on the iPads. We had teams that tried different cleaning solutions for the uh, stone, and that even included down here, we tried lasers on the stone to see if it would, you can see how badly stained the, that orange stone. That stone is supposed to be white and it was orange because of an improper sealer that had been applied sometime in the past. So we tried everything under the sun to make sure we were getting the right solution uh, for what we were doing. This was our scope of work on the project. All 12 elevations of the Capitol were tackled. There wasn't one elevation that we left off. We completed over 4,600 stone repairs. Now, what I mean by stone repairs is we would do what's called a Dutchman repair, where you cut out a little piece of stone and replace it with a similar piece of stone. All the replacement stone, we went back to the original quarry in Bedford, Indiana, and got stone from that original quarry area so that it would best match the stone on the building. That we repointed and put mortar in over 21 miles of mortar joints all the way around the building. We cleaned all the limestone and granite surfaces, and what that meant was a three step process. We started out with a power wash, then did a steam clean, and then on those, those parts that were really badly stained with that orange, we did what's called microabrasion. Microabrasion is similar to sandblasting, but what it is, it's small glass beads at low pressure so it doesn't damage the stone. You should never, ever ever, 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 ever sandblast limestone. Because the reason for that is limestone's a porous, uh, porous stone as it is. Limestone is meant to take in water, but it's also meant to expel the water. When you bring in, when you expand those pores, it takes in more water than it can expel. So you don't want to do that. And we were trying to, to fix some of that. So microabrasion, small glass beads at low pressure, it's gentle on the stone, but it cleans up the... Uh, it cleans up the staining. We restored all 477 original steel frame windows around the building. We installed new doors. Unfortunately, the old doors were too rusted and warped to be able to rescue. We installed new stair railings. We waterproofed the tunnel that went across the street. We installed a new copper roof and we installed new retaining walls and landscaping. 
So first on the stone repair. Like I said before, those 4,600 stone repairs, some of them might have been really small. Some of them were, like you see in the picture, was replacing entire uh, ton blocks of stone on the building. As I watched the gentleman there in that photo wield that stone into place, I couldn't believe the ease at which they did that. That stone was as, was as big as half of a car, and they were getting it right into place on our Capitol building, and it didn't look like they were even hardly breaking a sweat. Uh, by the way, I took that photo during the, the teacher walkout in 2018. So as everybody's rallying down below, these guys are just up there doing their thing. We did all the mortar repointing. So what that means is you have to grind the, uh, what, what was left of the original mortar out of there, and you have to replace it. And uh, that, that, you do that the same way you did it a thousand years ago, with a small trowel, with the, with the mortar. We went back and found the original mortar mixture mix so we could put the right mortar in for our stone so it wouldn't be chipping out in five years again. We did Dutchman repair. Now Dutchman, like I said, you take a new piece of stone, you cut out the old piece of stone, and then you use a stainless steel pin and pin it in, and then they blend it into the stone. You can hardly tell. You can see the difference here, the before and after of what happened on the building when they went and did their stone repair work, just incredible. I want to show you this process of the ornamental stone repair. The section I have highlighted in the red rectangle up there is one of the ornamental eagles, its wing was broken. Who knows how? Some of it might have been broken when they were putting in those pieces a uh, hundred years ago. Some of it just over time might have broken or chipped off. So what they did, second picture up in the middle, they put, uh, they cut out the affected piece of stone, they made a template so that they could go cut the new stone and then using stainless steel pins, they installed the new stone and then here's the best part. They brought their stone carver in who carved it to look just like it did before and you can see the result down there in the bottom right hand corner. His name was Yarick. He had carved the stone in Minnesota. He had carved the stone in, uh, on the Kansas State Capitol and now he's done the ornamental repairs on our Capitol and it was just phenomenal to watch. Window repair. Originally, we thought we would be able to remove the windows, send them off to Kansas City, have them restored, and then bring them back and put them in. Oh, how naive we were. Uh, those windows were mortared into the structure of the building. And so we actually had to go through and remove them, all the pieces that we could, but the structure we had to restore in place. Now, what does that mean? That means life is about to get really inconvenient for all our friends on the other side of that window. We had to change tactics. We had to go through in the offices and build a giant partition so we could separate themselves from the work. And what that meant is the lead paint abatement had to take place in place. All of the window repairs had to take place. So that, what does that mean? We went through a process where we used a sonogram system. We, we used it to, to gauge the thickness of the metal because a lot of the metal had been rusting from up, from the bottom up. Some of it had been set in wet mortar beds 100 years ago. Now, we had, to we had to determine what metal needed to be fixed, and sometimes you couldn't tell that from just an eye view. So on that sonogram, if it wasn't a certain number of thickness, then that meant we had to fix it. So this, it was very, very technical. And then that means it's grinding, it's cutting right there when someone's trying to work on the other side of the window. I want to tell you this, the window restoration was one of the most difficult aspects of the entire building. And uh, those steel frame windows were a bear. And let me tell you, they have come out beautifully. At the end of it, we put on a new, uh, we put new glass in the windows, and then we put on a, an interior storm window to help with the insulation. Steel windows means in the summertime, it's really hot on the other side of them, and in the wintertime, it's really cold. And we wanted to try to mitigate that a little bit. At a historic main entrance, those giant steel pocket doors had not seen the light of day in over 30 years. And so we went through the same process of restoring those, those pocket doors that we did on the windows. So we had two guys that spent three months going over every square inch of those pocket doors and all of that cast iron. If there were any cracks or imperfection, they filled them in with an epoxy because you don't want to have any water infiltration or they'll start rusting and they spent three months doing that meticulous work and then they were painted. The state seal, we analyzed the paint to determine the proper paint scheme for it and then added bird netting up at the top so the pigeons would find another place to live. 
The front of the Capitol, you can see them there. We, we scaffolded um, all around the building. Now, why did we put the tarp around the scaffolding? Well, all these materials that we're using, the mortar, the sealants that we're using, even the paint that we're using, it has to go in between 40 and 90 degrees. Now, that's about two days in Oklahoma. Um, so what we had to do was we had to tarp that scaffolding, and in the summertime, we ran air conditioning into it. In the wintertime, we ran heating into it. We had temperature monitors all over the scaffolding so that we could tell uh, if every, anything ever got out of balance. But what we didn't want to happen is apply these materials and they start failing five years later. So we go to the expanse and we do it right the first time so that we make sure we get the, the longest life out of our products. The picture you see there, this guy had to completely dress up into all the gear there. That's the microabrasion process. He's cleaning the base of those limestone columns there. And you can see the front. This was during the, the Kevin Stead inauguration ceremony and some of the lighting. And we'll show you some more lighting here in a minute. These are before and afters of the exterior lighting. And I showed you what Gary Beam did. Not only did he beautifully restore all those fixtures, but they're all wired for LED now. So they're much more energy efficient than they were before. Not only that, you can see in the first picture over there on the left, you see some of the pieces missing. Gary went back and found some of the original drawings of those pieces and refabricated them so that they can look exactly like they looked when the building was built in 1917. The stairs. Um, you know, two of my least favorite words on this entire uh, project was unforeseen circumstances. And uh, because that usually meant that I was about to spend more money than I wanted to spend. And stairs were part of that, and, and the West Plaza was for sure, too. So uh, we found out that the, the structure underneath the stairs, the structure for the battlements, was pretty much structurally unsound. What that meant, we had to take all those stair treads off and rebuild the stair structure and then go put them all back on. So you can see that finished product there in the middle photo there. Um, I'm... I have to tell you, other than the new stair railing, those stairs look the exact same. We put those treads back in the exact same place. We put everything back exactly as it was. person coming up, up here now would say, what did you do to the stairs? And we would say, but they're structurally sound now. And they weren't structurally sound before. Uh, same with the battlements. We took all the stone off the battlements, those, those uh, little outcrops that go all the way around the building, all the structure, the concrete uh, infrastructure below was not in good shape, destroyed it, rebuilt it well, like it should be, put all the battlements back together, and they look the same, but now they're ready to service for another 100, 150 years. The tunnel, uh, this was another really fun one. Um, it, two, you know, one of the things that you never want to do is disturb legislators' parking. And we had to basically carve our way through the House of Representatives parking lot for about six months in 2019. We had to dig up the tunnel, re-waterproof it, because it leaked so terribly. You can see that photo in the middle there of what it, that was routinely what it looked like. And then we had to work and waterproof that. Not only that, for a period of about two months, we had to, uh, when we got over to the section that goes over Lincoln, we had to divert Lincoln Boulevard through the House of Representatives parking lot so we could do that tunnel work as well. But the tunnel has come out great. It's waterproof now. You can see the vastly improved interior. Uh, it makes it really a nice, before this was not a good way to enter our capital. You didn't want any visitors coming in there. Now it's a nice, beautiful way to enter into the Capitol building. The copper roof replacement. This was one of the aspects of the project that we didn't think we were gonna need to do. We, we knew we would need to do roof repair, but as we got more and more into looking at it, we realized any bit of roof repair is just a Band-Aid. We need to do this the right way. So we puckered up and, and authorized the $9 million to completely restore the copper roof. Now, why copper? It's the original material. And we go back with original and like and kind whenever we can. But um, that new copper roof, if it's properly maintained, should last up to 80 years. And so hopefully it will be maintained the way it should. This was a, a project we weren't anticipating needing to do. But when we saw what it was, we decided we had to do it and get it done the right way. You can see the end result. Now, if you look over there, that copper's patinaed a little bit. It's not nearly that shiny anymore, but it is a beautiful watertight roof now. Moving over to the interior restoration project, we had to modern infrastructure. This was at its heart an infrastructure project. When you're talking plumbing, electrical, HVAC, data, 
all the things that you need. So one of the interesting things about the Capitol is most buildings serve one purpose. It's an office building. This building is primarily a museum, but it's also an office building. But most buildings do only one or two things. The Capitol does three things. The Capitol is a seat of government. You have to be able to come and petition your legislators. You have to be able, our legislators have to be able to meet and vote and vote in committee. It's also a museum. We have art in there. It's a way to learn about the history of our state. And it's also an office building. You have to design a building that meets three of those needs. If you design a building that meets two of those needs, then you haven't done what you need to do to fully restore the Capitol building. And we had to get the infrastructure back to where it should be. But we also had to restore the historic integrity of the building that had been degraded over years. And I'll show you some pictures of that. And then make it safe for people to use, not only from a security standpoint, but from an ADA standpoint and all of those things. So here's some photos of the interior damage to the building. The middle picture on the top is what I call friends do not let friends glue carpet over marble. <laughs> yeah, my reaction too. Uh, we found this time and time again in the Capitol building. Uh, over time as they needed to do different things, they would move out into historic corridors and build office. So they'd punch holes in the historic marble floors and build walls. They'd glue carpet over the marble. And that was, that's what resulted in the staining of the marble. You can see the photo here on the right of the original plumbing. You can see the photo on the bottom middle of a, 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 a historic plaster barrel vault ceiling where they'd come in and put in a drop, drop tile ceiling. Electrical, uh, we, in some cases we we're still, still using original electrical wiring from 1917. All of the electrical equipment running the building was about 50 or 60 years old. And then if you look above the ceiling, you can see the spaghetti mess of wiring that we got into. Uh, by the way, we never left the Capitol building. So what does that mean? That means that all the work we're doing, we cannot shut down anybody's telephone service. We can't shut down their air conditioning. We can't shut down their data. So what, when we come into a situation like that, that means that our team has to go, we have to trace out every wire. Where does it go? What does it do? And then we have to take out about 40%, 50% of the wiring above the Ceilings was just dead, abandoned in place, didn't do anything. And then we have to put in the new infrastructure while we are, uh, and then transition from the old to the new and then rip out the old. The logistics of this project were incredible. Uh, just the planning of all of this, I tip my hat to the people who worked on solving these problems because we could not, you, the legislature could not be voting on bills in February and all of a sudden their voting equipment goes out. That does, that's bad for me. <laughs> Guess who gets the phone call? And I did get a few phone calls from time to time. More interior damage. You have a historic plaster ceiling. When they come in and put air conditioning in in the 60s and the 70s, they just put in the drop tile ceiling, they run their piping, and they destroy the original ceiling. Exposed cabling, I call the, the top middle picture the path of least resistance because they could have put that cabling behind walls if they had wanted to, but they just decided, eh, whatever. So uh, the picture on the bottom middle, I call the hallway of horrible doors, over a hundred different types of doors in the building. As people had done different renovations, there was no attempt made for any kind of, uh, any kind of congruence to make sure that everything looked the same. It was, well, what can we find that's cheap and fast? And so the building just had a very disjointed feel to it. You walk into one office and it might have been remodeled in 1992. The other one might have been remodeled in 1972. So there was just no compre uh, comprehensive nature to the design of the building. And then the, the picture on the far right, you can see that's a spalled concrete, uh, concrete beam there because of water infiltration. One of the big reasons that got the legislature to start working on this project was in 2014, a piece of that concrete spalled and fell on a staffer's desk. Luckily, it was over a weekend, but it could have really uh, critically injured someone had they been sitting at that desk. And that was kind of a wake up moment for what needed to be done. This is our interior team that worked on the project. Manhattan Construction was the, uh, was the contractor on the project. FSB was the architecture and engineering firm. Steve Kelly was our historic preservation consultant. OESCO was our electrical contractor. Matherly was our HVAC contractor. I mentioned St. Louis Antique Lighting before. Green Country Interiors did drywall and plaster. Evergreen Architectural Arts did plaster and paint. 
elevated paver systems did marble restoration, new marble, new granite. Uh, EGR was the millwork contractor. The crucible is the one who, who did the new bronze state seal down on the ground floor. Sequoia did all the data cabling and Convergent did all the security cameras and access control in the building. Talking about the investigation process, we had to go through, we had to determine what kind of money we had to spend on the building and what our projects were gonna be. So we went through a very thorough investigation process just like we did on the exterior. So we knew what we needed to get into and we had an idea about what was happening before we went into construction. Now, does that mean that we didn't find some uh-ohs here and there? Uh, yes. Uh, one, of the big, one of the bigger ones I recall was we were planning on the first floor, we were planning some conference area space. And we're looking, so we've got some of the original plans for the Capitol sitting right over here. We were looking at the original plans for the Capitol and uh, that space looks all open. When we got into it, we found two structural beams right in the middle of what was gonna be our conference room. Well, we didn't know those were there. Uh, we figured out later that they, the treasurer's vaults were above us and they must have been added at some point after the plans were done to give some extra, uh, extra support for those treasurer's vaults. Well, now we got a problem. You can't have two giant beams in right in the middle of your conference space. So we have to call the engineers in. We spent about $300,000 to get a new steel structural system put in so we can take those beams out. Just one of many examples of the unforeseen circumstances that we run into from time to time on this project. The interior scope of work was massive uh, and it's even small. <laughs> I, I need to fix this slide. It's very small, isn't it? Um, it's, like I said, everything from uh, HVAC to plumbing to electrical uh, to the uh, new lighting and LED for the fixtures, ADA compliance, new elevators, uh, plaster and paint repair throughout the building. Uh, we did uh, a brand new paint scheme throughout the building with Evergreen Architectural Arts. We enhanced the visitor experience with new uh, new uh, cafe downstairs, we had new wayfinding stations, so all of those things throughout the building. I do want to mention some of the things that are currently in progress that will be scheduled to wrap up in the next month or so, and that's the House and Senate Chambers, the second floor Hall of Governors, which was the former Lieutenant Governor's Office, the second, price, the second floor Betty Price Art Gallery, which is moving up from the first floor, and the State Capitol Museum in the South Plaza. Okay, demolition. Uh, it's easy to think now, because last couple of years of the project, we've been in a lot of the pretty stuff. But in the first couple of years of the project, it was all the hard stuff. And so I want to give proper credit to the people who did the demolition work in this. It was hard work. And there was a lot of material to get out of this building. You see all the clay tile down here? Uh, what we did is we created what, what I call a zoning map for the building. And if it was an adaptive reuse zone where there wasn't original historic material like plaster or marble or anything like that, it gave us leeway to do that building, that part of the building how we wanted to. So in a lot of those cases, we just went in and poof, ripped everything out and started over again. That's that picture on the left there. That's in Senate member office area today. Um, the, the top middle picture you can see there is, is pieces of the, con the original concrete floor piled up. Our plan was to make the the basement, what today we're calling the ground floor, the primary public wing of the building. And we wanted to put marble down there, but the floor was kind of wavy. So we had to cut up all that floor. Not only that, we had to put in all the subterranean plumbing and conduit for electrical and everything. Now, you would think there would be an easy way to get that stuff out of the building. One wheelbarrow at a time, one wheelbarrow at a time. All that material, it either went out a chute out of a window but in that basement area, those guys carted those big pieces of concrete out one wheelbarrow at a time. I will forever be in awe of those people who did that day in and day out. Uh, you can see the picture of the excavator down there digging new plumbing lines. This was not an easy project, folks. This was not an easy project. This was a hard project. A lot of material, a lot of equipment. This was a re-envisioning in a lot of ways of our state capitol building. We we. Uh, expanded all, uh, all but one of the elevator shafts in the building, so that meant some heavy demo work. This picture up here, we actually built a new elevator for the governor to use. So that is what they're doing, is excavating that elevator shaft there. So a lot of hard work in the demolition crew, and I wanna make sure that I give them their due. 
new infrastructure. So we had, uh, we had, the building did not have an emergency power generator before. And so if we lost power, they had to put a generator in a truck, bring it over to the building. And so we have a brand new 828 kilowatt generator fed by natural gas. Uh, we got, it got its first real test last year during the, the big snowstorm when we lost power for several days and it performed like a champ. That thing, that thing doesn't uh, do all the electrical in the building, but it does fund those emergency systems or fuel those emergency systems like the IT rooms, the security equipment, the elevators, and the uh, emergency exit lighting. We have brand new electrical switch gear in there, two 3,000 amp redundant service systems. That's now the brand new electrical brain of the Capitol. It's so sophisticated, that thing can do everything but make you a cappuccino. I mean, it is, it is good stuff there. We put in hundreds of miles of brand new plumbing lines into the building. We, we put, in a new, uh, I put in a new unit on the roof to be able to, for the first time in the building's history, to condition the rotunda areas. This is some of the, the work that, this was really our first big project in the building and that was the ground floor west wing. And what we wanted to do was to expand the corridors and make them higher. You can see what it looked like here on the top right and what it looked like after we got done. Uh, we put all the electrical conduit underneath the ground so that we could get those ceilings up higher. We created a brand new corridor running through that area and then did marble, re marble work uh, throughout there brought in the limestone columns, and this was part of our design process. We, the Capitol was not originally painted. It was one of those things that was value engineered out of the building. It had never been properly painted in its entire existence. So we brought in Evergreen Architectural Arts, who's done historic painting in buildings across the country and across the world, and they helped devise a new painting scheme for the building that was historically appropriate for 1917, but also incorporated some of the color palette from the dome so that everything would work together and uh, be in partnership with each other. This is our new food service area. You can see what our food service area used to look like. Uh, you could serve about 10, 15 people in there and you could get a, get a hot dog maybe on a, a lucky day. And now we have a food service area where you can seat 60 people and we have a full kitchen in there now. Health Night Cafe, which is now called Be Healthy Cafe, is in there. They've been in there for about four or five years now and they've done an incredible job in there, but we have actual real food in the Capitol. I encourage you, go eat at their cafe. They do a great job in there. We have true food service now. Supreme Court. Supreme Court is probably one of the most ornamental build, uh, buildings in the uh, ornamental rooms in the whole building. That ceiling, that plaster ceiling in there is just incredible, but it hadn't been painted the way it should be. You know, when you paint plaster, uh, ornamental plaster appropriately, you should be able to see all of the details in the plaster standing from the floor. And there were so many details in our plaster that just tended to blend into the background because it hadn't been painted right. And they used a, a glazing technique to be able to do that. And then you also see down here in the bottom left, one of Evergreen's painters. You know, this wasn't just go spray it with a, you know, a machine. This was small paint brushes and meticulous work here. And then we, we commissioned brand new light fixtures that matched the original light fixtures that were in that room from 1917. Second floor corridor, you can see the difference here. But what I want to point out, it might be hard to see in this, in, uh, on this screen, but as you're looking down the corridor, because the walls in the Capitol were designed to be originally limestone blocks, we decided to paint all the walls in the building with what we call an ashlar paint pattern. Now the ashlar paint pattern is meant to mimic limestone, but what you don't want it to do is turn into a checkerboard. And so there was a lot of thought and work and a lot of mock-ups that went into making sure we got it exactly right so that it mimics a limestone wall going down those corridors, but it doesn't look like a checkerboard. And you can see the new LED lighting up in there. You can see we added up lighting, so it highlights the architecture up in the ceiling. The red lines also were added because once again, our ceiling has so many undulations and there's so much detail in the plaster, but it didn't come out before. And that simple addition of a red line, which by the way, not simple to paint. Have you ever tried to paint a straight curving line? I don't even want to think about how hard that is to do. But that addition, and then you can see, look how dull the marble floor was before, and now look at it after it's been fully restored. 
All of the marble floors went through a nine-step restoration process, and they are just beautiful. The blue room. This is probably one of the rooms that underwent the biggest transformation. The blue room was pretty plain before. It had gone through some different uh, renovations in the history of the Capitol, and in the 1960s was probably the most recent big renovation of the Blue Room. And it had this blue wallpaper on the wall, kind of a baby blue color, meant to resemble the Blue Room, I think, at the Virginia State Capitol. And we felt like that it was a room that had a lot of potential that it wasn't living up to. The Blue Room serves as the official, sort of the state room. It's the governor's uh, uh, reception room. They have uh, uh, ceremonial events in there, like bill signings, and they'll meet with dignitaries in there. And so what we did when we got into the Blue Room was really look, that, that ceiling was just a blank canvas. And Joe Batchelor and his wife Maricela, who are painters for Evergreen Architectural Arts, really just took it and took it to a whole new level there. And so all of the furniture was reupholstered in the Blue Room. Now in this photo, it looks a lot like that, that we painted the walls gold. Uh, it's coming across that way on the screen. That's actually not the case. It's a very muted tan, but because of the lighting there, it's coming out as a gold on the screen. But it looks much better. We added a new rug in there. We added a new sound system in there and restored the original light fixture. The house chamber, here's some uh, of the before and afters here on the house chamber. And you can see uh, Tim doing his stained glass restoration work in there and uh, the painting that went in. Now, the house chamber had been painted in 2000, but they'd used art students and it wasn't a very sophisticated painting palette. There's a lot of just bold colors thrown up there. And really what we went through here was, uh, we, we really went through the process of looking at, at those historic uh, areas and what it should look like. And so we had the opportunity here to come through and really have the detail in that plaster really come out. And you can stand on the ground and you can see all of the detail in the leaves of, the, of that plaster ceiling. This is the Senate Members Lounge. Uh, this is uh, behind the Senate Chamber and it's for members of the Senate to be able to use for meetings or receptions and social events. Uh, came through here and did new rug. A new light fixture was commissioned that was more period appropriate for the era. Painted the ceiling once again in that more historic paint pattern. And uh, I think a lot of the changes here are maybe a little bit more subtle than some of the other rooms, but it came out really, really nicely. The fourth floor rotunda was pretty fun. We had to scaffold up the whole thing all the way up to the base of the dome to be able to go in there and do all of the plaster repair and painting that we needed to do. Probably the biggest change in the fourth floor rotunda, in addition to the paint, was you know where they hung the portraits of the what they call Oklahoma's four favorite sons. They had furred out what was originally those areas, niches that were originally meant for statuary. They would furred them out and put walls there to hang the paintings on. We went back and restored those to their original uh, dimensions and depth. And now those paintings will go back, but they're going to be suspended and lighted in those spaces. And it's going to look really incredible when they come back later this year. But I think you can see the difference. The, the fourth floor to me now is so much richer than it was before because of the paint scheme. And I should also say all of the new lighting that came in and the, the Capitol was so dim. It was so dim before. You'd walk down hallways and you could hardly see where you were going. And now it is bright. It's inviting, and you get into that fourth floor. When, when the newscasters do their spots from the Capitol Rotunda, I'm usually not even looking at them. I'm just looking behind them because it looks so good now. This is the new ground floor rotunda. When we decided that um, uh, going back to making the, vi the building more visitor friendly, one of the things that we wanted to do, the original staircase up the front of the building into the base of the grand staircase, we couldn't use that as the main entrance anymore. And the reason for that is it's not ADA accessible. And there's really not a good place to put security equipment there. And so well, the determination was made, let's create a new visitor entrance to the Capitol. Uh, since that main entrance had been closed in the early 2000s, people had been coming in through a side entrance, and it really wasn't appropriate. It wasn't a good image. In fact, Steve Mason, who's the chair of the Capital Oversight Committee, said it was kind of like going into your friend's house through the garage. And so we wanted a new front door for the building. So we knew we were going to create that as a visitor entrance on the southeast side of the building. We're going to bring people in at the ground floor level. Okay. Well, what that means is 
we want to put all of the visitor amenities on the ground floor level. When you come in, we want you to be able to, the cafe is going to be down there, the expanded restroom bank is going to be down there, the new state capitol museum is going to be down there. Anything that you would need to find would be right there. But also, we wanted to create a way that th that floor connected with the rest of the building. When the capitol was built, the ground floor was called the sub-basement, and it was really storage space. Uh, it really wasn't a place that was designed for the public, and we were changing that. So we decided to cut a hole in the first floor rotunda, and what that meant was that uh, that original state seal, some of you had asked me about that, that original state seal ended up going away, and we created a new bronze state seal that was di that's down there. Uh, this thing weighs over 3,000 pounds. It's 14 feet in diameter. It had to be brought in in pieces and assembled. And it was over two years of a process of designing this. By the way, when we started this, we did not have a vector file big enough to you get it out expanded far enough and it would just pixelate. So one of our architects with Mass Architects ended up creating, basically recreating the state seal in a, in a file big enough to where they could start sculpting this and making it. So. Uh, incredible work, but we did create a brand new rotunda on the ground floor level that ties up to the rest of the building now, and it's come out so good. Wayfinding, the capital, if you're new to it, is a confusing place. It is, it, uh, some of the floors all look the same, and so what we wanted to do was help people get around the building. We created a sophisticated wayfinding system. So at every entrance when you come in the building, there's a screen now. And it's a touch screen where you can go on if you want to find where is Senator McCourtney's office. You can type in his name and it'll give you directions. It'll, it'll put a little, uh, a, a little walking path. It'll show you which elevator to go to, which floor to go to, and where to go to after you get off the elevator. And then if you've forgotten, you go up to the fourth floor and you go, oh, now I've forgotten. There is a wayfinding station at every elevator bank, four places on every floor, so that people won't get lost. And now, if you're coming to the Capitol for an event, say it's 4-H day at the Capitol, and where is that at? I, they told me, but I forgot. Now all the events are listed on those wayfinding screens all over the building, and you can press those and it'll tell you how to get there as well. So this is a big improvement for visitors coming to our building. And probably one of the biggest improvements is our visitor entrance at the building. This, we decided to do this and go subterranean. The reason is you don't want to build up a structure that's going to obscure the historic profile of the building. So we built this new visitor entrance. You walk down into the area, and this is a beautiful new front door for our capital. And one idea I completely stole, and I'm proud of it, is this marble a county map of Oklahoma. I call it the Oklahoma welcome mat. When you walk into those sliding glass doors into the new visitor entrance, it's right there. Kansas had one in their terrazzo floor, and I said, we're going to do that, but let's do it better. And so we put it in marble down here, and it's just an incredible addition to the building. You see the vestibule down here where the marble map is? I remember one time before this was built, looking outside my window and seeing it was OETA day at the Capitol. And that meant that, you know, Bert and Ernie are there and some of the OETA folks. And, and so moms and kids were coming to the building to see all their OETA heroes. And what I saw was a line of moms and strollers lined up to get into the building outside in the rain. That should not be the case in our capital. And so we designed this vestibule area. If there's 200 people trying to get in the capital at the same time, which is rare, but it happens occasionally, They've got a place to queue up in this vestibule area so they can be out of the weather and out of the elements. This is one of my favorite additions. And this was a late addition to the project because we were waiting to see if we had enough money to do it. But the Capitol has been dark for a long time. It had a very old lighting system around it that was probably installed sometime in the 1960s or 1970s. And so we wanted to add new lighting all the way around the building, not only just for aesthetic reasons, but for security reasons as well. So now there are 186 LED fi uh, fixtures that are mounted in the dome, on the flat roof, and on the ground all the way around the building. And you can do, right now it's preset for 64 different color patterns you can do. So if the Thunder win a game, you can outfit, you can color the capital in blue and orange. If it's 4th of July, you can see you can do red, white, and blue up here. This one is purple, so that's fun. 
but you can do pretty much any color combination imaginable. These are all LED lights now, and, uh, and they're on, so if you drive by the Capitol tonight, you'll be able to see that. Every day at sunset, it's set to go through about a 15-minute pattern of colors that kind of mimic a sunset, and so that's kind of fun, too. Work in progress right now. I talked about a few of the uh, the things going on, uh, and so I won't uh, I won't belabor that point. Uh, a few things that are noteworthy, and uh, we're getting to the end here, folks. So just stay patient with me. Uh, a few things that are noteworthy here: wonderful finds and incredible people. We found all kind of cool stuff when you get behind the walls and get above the ceilings. Stuff that's been back there for 30, 40, 50 years, and here's just a few of the things we found. So we've got some. Coke cans and soda cans and one beer can that we found, a Schlitz beer can, I think, from the 1950s. Uh, we found a note, the far left bottom there, note dated 1933 by workers who were working in that area and wrote their names down. We actually put that out on our Facebook page and we found people that were related to the, those workers, which was a lot of fun. We found a newspaper clipping. This was dated March the 30th of 1917. Now, Look at the headline, if you can see it. Germans torpedo another number of lives lost. March 30, we go into World War I on April the 6th of 1917. So uh, this is a, a really interesting artifact that we found there. We found, of course, cigarette wrappers, uh, found a Senate gallery pass from 1963, found a Milky Way wrapper from the 40s, and then we found a bunch of other stuff that, that we have. We're going to display a lot of this stuff in the new State Capitol Museum, so you'll be able to come see some of the things that we found over time. And then I like to talk about, this wasn't just a hard job. It was a hard job, but we had a lot of fun while we were doing it, too, and we had a lot of laughs. And I have to say, I got close with a lot of people who worked on this, this project, because I'll tell you one thing, Manhattan, J.E. Dunn, our historic preservation consultants, our skilled trades, our demolition folks, these people were as passionate as we were about making sure the project was done right. And I was thrilled to get to know them and to work with them every single day. And uh, I'm thrilled even now when I go over there and see some of them still working to finish up the project. So I do want to call out uh, a couple of people who are here. I talked about Tim. Tim is our stained glass consultant from our, our, our stained glass guy from Edmond. He restored all the stained glass in building. He did such a good job for us. Russell Baker, wave your hand, Russell. Russell is an architect for Manhattan Construction. Uh, he has been on the project since 2015 and just poured his life into this project as well. And we're just so proud of the people that have worked so hard to make sure that this was all done right. And, uh, and of course, we had a lot of support from the legislature. We had a lot of support from the private community. Um, I have not really run into anybody who uh, has not been a fan of the work that we're doing, and so I do appreciate that. One more thing I want to mention before we get into the Q&A part of this is I am working on a book about the state capitol, and this is uh, we're working on with Arcadia Publishing. So this is going to cover the capitol up till 2010, and I've got treasure troves of historic photos that Chad Williams and the research staff are helping me to curate. And so hopefully uh, this book should be out by the end of the year. And uh, if I ever finish writing the stupid thing, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I'm on chat. I've just finished chapter four. I got four more chapters to go, but we'll have, have this book out and it'll be a great way to learn more about the state capitol as well. So with that, um, I do want to open it up to questions if there are any. And I do want to thank you all for being a part of this. Yes, sir. I have a question. Way back earlier, you mentioned the uh, discolored stone that Governor Lewis was good about. Is that still on the Capitol? Presumably it is. And I actually, yeah. I, I actually did go to try to find it because the newspaper article did mention where it was, but I could not find anything that was more discolored than any of the stone around it. What I'm guessing is that over time, and this happens with limestone, it kind of blends in. In fact, today, if you go up to the Capitol and you look at the new big stone blocks, particularly at the ones up high above, you can pretty much tell which ones are the new ones. But over time, they'll blend in, and I imagine that's what happened with the, the Governor Williams stone. But if I could find it, I might go put a plaque on it. <laughs> Great question. Any other questions? Yes. 
fifth floor on the house side through the vault. Distribution of water. Why was it there if it didn't give it's not a vault now? Because the question was there, were, there was a vault on the fifth floor house side that was being used as, a, as an office. Well, originally in the Capitol building, there were over 20 vaults in the building. And they were paper vaults, most of them. Most of them didn't hold any kind of money other than the treasurer's vaults down on the second floor. But they, um, uh, they had vaults for paper. Now, when our Capitol was built in 1917, one of the things that they boasted about was that our Capitol was quote unquote fireproof. They put steel windows on the building. All the doors were hollow metal frame doors. All the door frames were metal. All, even the base around the floors was a metal base. And then, of course, marble floors, past plaster walls. They wanted to make the building as fireproof as possible. But just to add that extra bit of insurance, they put these concrete vaults all throughout the building so that they could place important papers in there so if there were a fire to break out, that it, it, they would be more protected in those areas. So over time, as they didn't need the paper storage anymore, they didn't need those vaults, they turned those into offices for people to be able to use. And in, in some cases, they even kept the old original vault door on, on the office. And now, most of those vaults have gone. Uh, we, have, we have kept some of them. If we didn't need to destroy that concrete structure for those vaults, then they were kept in place. But uh, most of them, are all gone now. Yeah, Chantry? Trey, if I remember correctly, before we had the dome, did we have a stained glass looking dome there in the center? And if so, does it still exist? Yes, and in some cases it still exists in the building. So uh, thank you for that question. The, uh, they did not put the dome on the building. They did a quasi-dome. We call it the shallow saucer dome. So what they did is they built a structure with a shallow stained glass saucer dome. So it, it mimicked having a real dome on the building. And there was a plaster state seal in the middle of that dome. When they took that out in 2002 to build the dome that we have today, all of that stained glass for that original saucer dome was kept. So I'm proud to report to you today that that stained glass has been reintegrated into the Capitol. So on the ground floor, when you go into the new State Capitol Museum that'll open up in a couple of months, as you look above and you see that stained glass there, that is the original stained glass from the saucer dome. And Tim restored that too, so. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so we knew that when we cut the hole in the floor that that, that Terrazzo State Seal was not going to survive. That Terrazzo State Seal was, was put in in 1966. And so what we decided to do was cut it up into small pieces, all about yay big, few inches wide, few inches long. And our, my original plan for that was I wanted to take those pieces and sell them as mementos in the gift shop. People could come buy a little piece of the state capitol. By the way, we did take some of the original limestone and create coasters and a set of bookends and things like that. And that is for sale in the gift shop right now. And you can go buy that. The House and Senate, um, uh, our friends over there decided that they wanted those pieces. And so all those pieces of the Terrazzo State Seal have been turned over to the House and Senate. For what purpose, I'm not sure what they're going to do or have done with them. But they requested that we turn that over. And because it's their space in the building, we, we diligently complied. So... Any other questions? I have a question. Yes. It's wonderful to get to look for photographs for, for Trey's project. And uh, it's crazy how many dome uh, proposals there were. And there's literally, and Trey's done more research than I just say, there's an office building going straight out of the Capitol. Did they really think about doing that? Yeah, it, so the dome, the dome thing never went away, the question of the dome. Even after the building was built, there were people that did pass legislation and they wanted to get the funding for a dome and it just never quite materialized. In the mid-1920s, they were already starting to run out of space in the capital. And especially by the 1930s, as we have the Great Depression and government is growing to be able to meet the needs of the Great Depression, they start running out of space in the capital. So one of the first things that they, uh, that they decide that they want to do is they have a rendering that they complete. They want to build an office tower right up instead of a dome on top of the Capitol. We actually have renderings of that. You can go search for them on the Gateway to Oklahoma History 
And, and there will be a picture in my book, too. But it's wild. It looks like the biggest Frankenstein monster that you've ever seen. And I'm so glad that they didn't do that because it would have been a terrible idea. They ultimately ended up building the Historical Society building and then the, the, what they called the Capitol Office building that later became the Jim Thorpe building to alleviate the office pressures. And then, of course, the four buildings north of the Capitol. And so, um, yes, there were several proposals to build not only just a regular dome, but office towers instead of a dome on the Capitol. Yes? Uh, before the restoration and, and the addition of the Capitol Dome, a number of artists submitted models of sculptures to go on top of the dome, and they were placed in some of the niches, the wall niches around the Capitol. Where have they gone and will they be back? So, yes, the, there were several proposals for the the, the, to place the finial sculpture on the dome, which by the way, our capital is the first capital in the country to have a Native American statue on top of the dome. But the finial sculptures uh, that were submitted as part of that contest were placed in niches around the stairways, and those will be coming back. The Arts Council is in the process now of planning the return of the art to the building. So every, all of the art in the building that we could remove has been in storage since 2016. So there are a lot of people who have never even seen the building with art in it, and it's gonna be as fascinating and great as the building looks now, it's gonna look even better when the art comes back to it in the next few months. Not only is the Arts Council planning for the art to come back, but they've also put together a comprehensive plan of where it's going to go, and it might not be in the place that you remembered it before, because we wanna tell a more comprehensive and um, uh, connected story with the art. And so there'll be some pieces that get placed differently than you might remember it before. But part of this project also was a million dollars in art and public places funds that has been used to commission new art for the Capitol. So in addition to the art that you saw that, is, that was there before, there will be quite a few pieces of new art that you'll get to enjoy as a part of the art coming back to the building. Yes, and then Jim. Uh, I noticed uh, during the restoration project there were some partitions that did end up getting kind of muralized by Dr. Bob Palmer and others that came in and did some art. What happened when those partitions were removed because the construction finished? Did that art just make it to dumpster? Yeah, it's my understanding that, that most of that was thrown away unless any, any of it was salvaged by people who just wanted to keep. And I know I've seen some staffers in the Capitol that have a little cutout piece of it uh, in their offices here and there but most of that was just all went away. Jim? Trent, there's always rumors out of Capitol for some reason. When you took the portrait of the four uh, favorite Oklahoma sons, there was rumor that you were gonna come back with statues instead of the paintings. Was that ever under consideration or was it always to bring the paintings back? Yeah, it was briefly under consideration. You know, we had that million dollars in art and public places funding and, and you know, the Arts Council is the one who, who works and does most of the art in the building. But what ultimately what we decided, we never got very far down the road with that. And the main reason is, is because statues would be really expensive uh, to have done. And it would pretty much take up all or even more than our art and public places budget. So when it comes to getting new art in the building, now we've got a brand new rotunda on the ground floor that needs to be filled with art. There are other gaps in the art collection of stories that, that the Arts Council wanted to tell. So ultimately became, let's get the most bang for our buck and let's, let's get a lot more new art instead of blowing all our money on, on, on some statues. I don't know that I would necessarily be opposed to statues in the future, although those Charles Banks Wilson portraits have been there since the late 1960s and I think they look great. And I think they're gonna look great in the, in the new niches as well. Yes, sir. In, in some elections, Yeah, the question is, was there a plan for a, a triumphal arch down, <laughs> down by 13th Street? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that. So yes, there was plans for a triumphal arch. It was going to be made of the same limestone that the Capitol is building. I have the dimension somewhere, something like 150 feet long. It was going to commemorate Oklahoma soldiers who died in World War I. And then even up in the top of the arch, it was going to have like an observation deck. And then it was going to have like a museum in it where you could go see some artifacts from the war. So that never really got off the ground. There was a model of it in the Capitol, in the early days of the Capitol. 
And basically, other nations that were doing these types of things decided they wanted to wait five years before any monuments were done to World War I so they could properly appreciate what happened. And the same thing happened with, you know, with the arch that happened with the dome. Time goes by, plans fall by the wayside. You know, Solomon Layton also had a very intricate uh, plan for all the landscaping south of the capital that even to this day has never been fully realized. And so one of the things that we looked at early on that, you know, I've still got a few like, limps in my, in my body and some tire marks on my back from <laughs> is because we proposed early on to build that arch and to put it down there. And it wouldn't have been very expensive in the grand scheme of things, I think about $700,000. And it was always proposed as an extra add-on. And because uh, we wanted to redo all of the south, we wanted to turn that south parking lot into green space, build a parking garage on the east side that would connect into the tunnel, and then have a lot more green space for the building. And boy, did we get killed over that proposal. <laughs> the, the, we got editorials in the newspaper against it, wasting money and all those kinds of things. So that proposal, it, it died, it never went anywhere. It would have been about an extra $60 million to do everything that we wanted to do out there. So uh, it, it didn't ever go anywhere. We, we tried to resurrect the arch and not so much. <laughs> yes? Is, is any of the artwork that has already been there and will eventually be added, is there an opportunity to get prints of any of those? Yeah, you know, a lot of the artwork still has the artist copyright on it, and that really inhibits the, the ability to get prints. I know people have asked from time to time, and the artist has to usually be the ones, or the artist estate has to be the ones to release the copyright to do that kind of thing. So I know the Arts Council has looked into it. I'm not sure, I'm not sure where they've come to that. I know we, the gift shop gets asked quite a few times to be able to do that. But um, um, I don't know the status of that right now. And one more art question. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's used as a meeting room for legislators. Uh, that was the paintings done about the soldiers that were lost at World War II. Yes. And it, those aren't available to the public because... Yeah, so the, the triptych that was done by Gilbert White, which was called Pro Patria, which was the first piece of art ever added into the Capitol building, was added in 1928. November 11th, 1928, it was dedicated, in fact. And there were about 1,500 people who showed up in the Capitol for that dedication ceremony. That triptych, one of the panels is over the Grand Staircase, and the two others are in what used to be empty corridors that went down to the end and they had those the, the other paintings that have the names of the World War II, I'm sorry, World War I soldiers who died in the war. In the 1970s, they added those committee rooms for the legislature to be able to use. And unfortunately, uh, they are off limits to the public now. Now, you can go to a public meeting there when they're having those meetings and you can see those. But if you're doing a general tour of the Capitol, those, uh, those rooms are generally locked. One of the things that we did in the restoration pro project we really wanted to remove those committee rooms and make those empty corridors again, but unfortunately we, we couldn't find the room anywhere else in the building to be able to add that many committee rooms. So that ended up staying. We did add better glass over those committee rooms so that you can see into those rooms and see the paintings a little bit better, but those are both House and Senate committee rooms and we don't have much influence over whether those are open or closed or anything like that. That's, those are House and Senate discussions. Yes. Did the north entrance to the building change anything? The north entrance ha hasn't really changed. It's um, it's not really a, a main entrance in th into the building anymore. The main entrances that you can come in is the new visitor entrance on the south, and then the east and west entrances. But the north entrance, since 23rd Street went underground in the 1970s, that really became a, a, a non-viable entrance. Not many people use it anymore. And so uh, it's not a public entrance, and I, I don't think there are any plans to make it a public entrance. Yes? Is the uh, parking location move or expand with the new entrance? No, it's still the same. It's still out there uh, south of the derrick where, where it's always been. Like I said, we had hoped and put forth the idea of a parking garage, and it's not an idea that I've completely given up on yet because I think it would be a better solution to our parking needs. 
uh, and uh, hopefully we can do that at some point. But as of right now, visitor parking is still in the same area. Yes. Uh, the <clears throat> Supreme Court chamber has been closed off to tours for a few years now. Uh, do you have any pull with getting <laughs> So, so I'm going to tell you guys a little secret here about the Capitol building. Um, the Capitol is like Europe. It is carved up into everybody has their own little jurisdiction. There's not one entity that manages the Capitol. So the House has parts of it, the Senate has parts of it, Supreme Court has parts of it, and then whatever's left, OMS has some parts of it. And so what it means is there's all these little fiefdoms in the Capitol that sometimes play well with each other and sometimes don't play well with each other. And so when you talk about the committee rooms in the House not being accessible, when you talk about the Supreme Court, everybody has their own say over those, own, those particular areas in the building. I did work when I was there uh, to try to convince them to have that open for tours. They had closed it down for tours because they used to just leave the door open and then people would go in there and mess with stuff. And so they said, okay, we're closing it down because people would go sit up at the bench, you know, play around with things, move stuff. And uh, so they said, all right, no more people going in the building. I had worked with them to try to convince them to uh, just give the key, give a key to that door to the tour guides down there so that they could take people in on official tours so that it would be monitored. Um, that I thought I was getting somewhere and it didn't quite. So... I would just encourage you, reach out to the Supreme Court and, and uh, ho there's an administrative office of the courts and just let them know that you would like it to be open and that's probably the best you can do. That, that courtroom is actually still used by the court. If they have oral arguments, they use that room over there. They don't use the courtroom in the, the new building they're in. They, they actually still use their ceremonial courtroom. So. Yes? Mm. They'll be back there in storage right now. So the question is about the bronze statues of the governors. Those statues will be back in the next few months as they're bringing all the art back into the building. They'll be going into a little bit of a different place. So if you remember on the second floor where the lieutenant governor's office was, that is, is historically an ornamental corridor. We were able to open up that corridor. We moved the lieutenant governor down to the first floor at the base of the small staircase and so that enabled us to open up that corridor and restore it historically. Now we have gone back and we're moving the Hall of Governors over to that corridor and the Betty Price Art Gallery moving up from the first floor into the corridor where the Hall of Governors was. So are there plans to add to the Hall of Governors? Here? Yeah, so, so there, um, Governor Stitt, I think, is in the process of getting his bust sculpted. So I, every time there's a new governor, they get a new bust that comes in there. Yeah. What is the schedule of the tours if you have a big English now you want to go over the Usually from 9 to 3, and they do them on the hour. And you can just, you don't have to reserve in advance. You can just go down there. There's a beautiful gift shop now down in the ground floor of the Capitol. It's right, right as you come into the visitor entrance. You can't miss it. They've got a lot of great stuff down there and great tour guides as well. Chad, did you have something you wanted to say about some of the materials that are left out, or, or Laura? Laura, go ahead. I just wanted to say, Trey, thank you so much. 